Hello, everyone, and welcome into debate night yet again. Uh, finally, we have debate night after a Pro Tour event, which means we got all kinds of storylines. It's going to be a very fun show. But let me introduce everyone that is joining me today. First off, as always, we got Brody Smith. I'm very excited to uh, do better in this show than I did in the weekend. I will be finishing top four. <laughs> there you go. That's a, that's an improvement. Uh, you know what? Baby steps. Baby steps. We're also Slight joined by Michelle. <laughs> Hello, all the way from Sweden. Heck yeah! We just discovered it is midnight when we're recording this. For I was her, about to so say, what yeah. time is it over there? Almost, almost debate morning, which would have just been what the show was last year. Yeah, it is midnight. Oh yeah, it is right at midnight now. Yeah. Uh, we're also joined yet again by Lucas. What's up, guys? Good to be back. Uh, I stayed at school last time because I thought the connection would be better than at home, and that was objectively false. And thankfully, it looks basically no better now. So we'll get there. <laughs> it's all right. I, I have there has been a spoiler that Lucas did not bring a spreadsheet this week, so I'm already subtracting points off from him. We're also joined by Matthew. <laughs> How's it going, guys? Happy to be back. Excited to yell about some stuff right now. Heck yeah. All right. Well, let's get first into this, uh, straight into this first topic here. The chess.com invitational broke a lot of streaks this past weekend. To name some, we had AB finally winning, Evelina's first win in four years. Paul McBeth was five for five at this event, throw down the mountain coming into the weekend. Calvin Heimberg, it's his first time outside the top five since last June. It's also the first time in McBeth's career that he has played in and finished outside the top 10 at the opening DGPT or NT event. Which one of these streaks ending is the most surprising to you? We're going to kick it off with Brody. Well, unfortunately, we did not have an actual streaker at the event. Um, we did have a P controversy, so there was that. Uh, but no streaker. But going to your question, I think the two that stand out to me from the, the grouping that you gave us is Calvin Heimberg. I mean, obviously looking at that and seeing – you know, him finishing outside the top five, if he was like sixth or seventh, I think you could maybe give it a pass, but he really did struggle at this event. He struggled the first day putting. He didn't really look like himself. Now there has been some rumblings that there might be some sort of injury that he's dealing with. And if you remember back to Beaver state fling, where he had probably his worst performance, uh, he also had some back I issues going on there. So this simply could just be an issue with some sort of thing that was kind of tweaking with him. And uh, he just wasn't himself this week. But the one I'm going to probably go out with is, is saying AB winning. I think what we're seeing these past few seasons is how difficult it is to win. And so someone that is has been so close, I think this was his 11th featured car or lead card going into an elite series or major. So this was his 11th chance to win, and he finally was able to do it. Uh, there's so many people, so many good players on tour that have never been able to do it before. So him finally breaking through and doing it, I think that was the most impressive. Definitely an impressive performance for AB out there this weekend. No way around that. Michelle, which one of these was most surprising to you? Yeah, like If you're looking at the ones that you uh, named, I think that... like. A, B, Evelina, that they they won. I mean, I don't think that that's surprising. Um, they played really good last year, and Evelina actually stepped up and ended on a good note last year. So I think that her actually getting the win, I think that she deserved it, and that she had work for it. Um, and at the same time, like, looking at Paul, like, everything surrounding him, his injury, uh, all the work that he does surrounding, I don't think that it's... Uh, surprising as well that he uh, couldn't deliver especially on a course that's so sh challenging so I agree I think Calvin I think everyone has been like wants to like push him forward and like uh, he has been playing so good that um, and consistently being on top that I really think that him not being able to perform uh, is surprising because he did win first event last season so that he's not up there is surprising. Yeah, I will definitely say Calvin was a little bit of a shock to the system seeing where he ended up. Uh, he was a lot of people's favorites going into the weekend. Um, what about you, Lucas? What do you think? Uh, first off, I just wanted to say that ESPN's graphic guys would have had a field day with all these streaks. I mean, this is just their 
uh, dream come true. But to the question, the most surprising broken streak, I think, is definitely Evelina winning after her long hiatus. Uh, I'm going to go through each one of these uh, to hopefully show you guys why that's the case. Um, first, we knew AB was going to win eventually. Winning is a skill you have to learn. It's a proven true fact in sports. He has a complete game and is too talented not to get a win. So therefore, I don't think AB winning is that surprising. Maybe surprising it's this early in the season. Uh, next, Calvin not being top five isn't too surprising either. Uh, first of all, an over six month long top five streak is insane. It's one of those that other sports uh, broadcasts would be talking about from the month it started until the moment it ended, but you knew it was going to end eventually. It's also less surprising after watching Calvin play last week at the All-Star event. There were a couple of shots where you just saw him completely miss his line even before the rain started, and then he missed a 12 foot on the second hole of the season. Not a great look. Uh, but then for Paul's streaks, I don't think any of us were surprised for him not to win or even finish top 10 coming off the injury. His main focus for the weekend was the exhibition of his course and also him just playing the event, period. Um, that that leaves the Evelina um, as the main surprise for this weekend. Um, Evelina doesn't have a complete game like AB and Calvin and these other people. Uh, everyone knows that she's one of the most talented throwers in the FPO division but her putting has never been great. And so I think her putting holding her back, we haven't seen a lot of people find that missing piece in their game all the time. So even though she was only able to make two out of three putts from search C1X, she was still able to pull off the win, even though it was 89% in the final round. All right. Yeah, definitely, you know, debunked some there. Maybe stole some thunder from Matthew coming up, but we'll see what also, you have to say. Also, lots of rebuttals. Lots yeah, of rebuttals for a lot of people. Yeah, All right. lots of rebuttals. We'll get to the rebuttals here in a second. Matthew, we're going to let you go first here. Actually, Lucas, I am going to remove one point. I said I wasn't going to do it. I said it wasn't going to be strict, but you did go quite a bit over time there. So, you know what? I got to stick to Trevor. Trevor would have done it. He might not be able to see it, though. His internet's so bad. He that might is not be fair. able to see you know the what? clock. Point added back. That's fair. He's probably looking at pixels. He's probably like playing a 90s video Brown. game right now. Okay. It's the same thing as I'm looking at my score. I never know what I have. That's just colorblindness. That's a whole different animal we'll tackle later. All right, Matthew, what'd you think? Listen, everyone wants to say that I had thunder stolen from me. No, because last year on this show, one year ago, almost, Kristen Tatar failed to take a W, and someone asked, will we ever have that happen? Will anyone else go with it on a streak like her? And I said one year ago that Evelina could if she just learned to putt. And now here we are. One year later, she took a W. Did she learn how to putt? No. <laughs> Will she? Probably not. But I was had it there. And to be clear, Lucas is kind of right. AB's got a complete game. We expected a W from AB at some point. He is too young. He's had too many years on the tour to never get a W. Paul Macbeth, we all expected that. The sport's going crazy. Who's like... The fact that Paul Macbeth had such a long streak is impressive, but it's ending. There's no situation there. The one that was actually the most unexpected had to be Calvin. And I don't disagree with Lucas that it's crazy for someone to be top five for six months, but it's Calvin. Okay. Bro also could not take a W in that time period, except for like one or two little ones. Like he's fighting for his life here. So he's doing well. And I kind of just expected that all the rest of the season. I think it's really the most unexpected. And th the length I had to scroll down to find Calvin's name this weekend just broke my heart. And really, that was the unexpected thing, in my opinion. Yeah, Calvin's performance, definitely unexpected, that's for sure. And I, you know, I appreciate the passion. Uh, you did predict it in some ways. So, Brody, you brought up a rebuttal first. Let's hear what you have to say. I mean, obviously the rebuttal is Kristen Tatar is not here. So when Kristen Tatar is not here, we all know any FPO player can win. If Evelina can beat Kristen Tatar, I think if she would have been in the field and Evelina would have won, then I think that definitely takes the cake. I don't even think you actually even have a question here. I think it's obvious that Evelina winning was the biggest story or the most surprising thing that happened. The other thing is, can we check? Uh, can someone fact check these PDGA Live people? I know we're switching from UDIS to PGA Live. Evelina went 100% inside of Circle 1X and led the field. Can, can someone mm. fact check that real quick? Um, that actually she, happened? She didn't miss a putt inside a circle? Uh, the last uh, round, she didn't miss one putt, but she laid up the last putt uh, for the win. So that made her stats go to 89. Yeah, but they, that's she I don't think it's fair. It's not in 89% because she laid it up. I, no, they I didn't saw, count. It was 89%. I saw, yeah, I'm I looking saw at it right now, Brody. 
I saw a graphic that said 100%. What graphic was I looking at? Yeah, that was last season, last round. They might have they might have put it at 100% because she laid up the putt for the win, but the technical percentage well, was 89%. That's, that's not how statistics work, though. Hunter. I agree. The, the PDJ Live has it at 89%. <laughs> I believe it was 8 for 9 or something like okay. that. All right. Yeah, All right. but but they did put up that graphic before she made uh, the layup. Oh. So oh, she was 100% was. up until that point, yeah. Oh, so they threw up graphics leading. Okay, so that's what it was. Yeah, I saw up to that the gra- green for eight. Yeah, because yeah. I saw a graphic that was showing her like first in all these categories, and you're saying that was put up before. Okay, that makes yeah. a lot more sense. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move into. No, that's impressive. Eight for nine. What the? Or heck? Michelle, did you have a rebuttal as well? No, that was uh, yeah against the Valina because I think that she did have good stats that and didn't deserve eight and nine percent. Okay, there you go. There you go. I've got a rebuttal. Brody, did you say, unfortunately, no one streaked at this event? <laughs> well, I mean, that would have been cool. First event. That would have got, that would have got some hype, I think, around it. If, if we probably would have loved, made Sports okay. Center. I would have loved, I, for me, I just want to see what Disc Golf Network would do in that situation because I don't think any of us have any idea what they, They've just got the it. guy with the camera from James Conrad's shot. He's just booking it after the guy. To just yeah, I was going to say, like, who, who's, tackling, who's, yeah, tackling, say, who's tackling him? Who's tackling him? Who's tackling him? Who's, Jeff Corns isn't tackling that guy. <laughs> Uh, maybe yeah, not. Let's, all, let's all be honest, honest about that. Hey, it, might, it depends. Hey, I don't know. This, the, it, I, they probably would have put Nick Carl. Nick Carl's got some sneaky scurry speed. He probably would have come out of nowhere and just lit this guy up. But you know what? Hopefully that's a question we never have to answer or find out. How do I um, find stats? Where are B- the statistics? BDJ Live. <laughs> like, I just right. see scores, though. Where, where can stats I see? Click on their name. Click on their name, buddy. There's also a stats tab. Now I'm just now I'm on their PGA. Now I'm on their PGA. I click on their um, name. They just sends me to their PGA um, thing. Uh, Does uh, anyone uh, actually know how to find stats from this I'm tournament? Yeah, it's, right it's on the PGA <laughs> Live. You just there's a stats I'm tab. I'm on yeah. the PGA Live Hunter. I don't know what to tell you. A Submit a button that says scores. If you click scores, it drops down and stats is one of the options. They're not great stats, but they're there. Wait, what website are you on now? There is no there is no top <laughs> left button. Um, I'm on oh, I'm no. on pgalive.com slash app slash tournament slash I'm on the tournament. I can see Evelina minus 16 first place. There's no stats on here. Uh, wait. Are you on the tournament page or are you on the live scoring page? There's different pages? What, what, what How many pages are there? Well, yeah. <laughs> one's the tournament result. One's the live scoring. Uh, Brody, <laughs> click, click directly to the right of Ele- Evelina's name. Minus 16? No, directly to the right of her name on the FPO. He's yeah, not on pops. the right page. He's now, on the PGA oh, tournament. Goodness. He's on the oh, tournament result page. Rody, just what support. Right page? Submit, uh, submit a ticket with the IT help desk. We'll have Silas, okay. you know, screen record with you, walk you through it. <laughs> okay. Um, and we'll we'll just move on from here. Okay. This next question can kind of go along with the first question, but it's going to be a more open floor, more open question here, which is whose performance this weekend, good or bad, surprised you the most? We're going to kick it off with Michelle. Yeah, so I was looking at like the top 10 in the MPO field. And when looking at that board, I see two like surprising names. One, number one, obviously, is Joseph Anderson and Roman Casaplast. That was so much fun to see on live coverage, and he didn't tour a full season last year. Um, so he really took like a step forward <laughs> being filmed and everything. So it's going to be interesting to see how his tournament and his season is going to turn out. I also think that looking at the board and looking at like live coverage, it was really fun to see the European player Yassin Yeminen. Uh, he also delivered some really great golf this weekend, end up uh, in ninth place which is higher than he de- uh, delivered last season. Um, he did play really good on the European tour last season, but he didn't perform on the few tournaments that he actually played in the U.S. So it's going to be fun to see him on the tour as well. And I also think that Ella, and when we're looking at FPO, I think that it surprised me that she uh, she can't come like all the way through. She plays really good. She plays really solid. Um, but on the third round, it feels like she always like can't get there. Um, and uh, it's a bust because I really want to see her go all the way. Uh, and we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, no, we've definitely had that topic before where it just feels like Ella Hansen gets 90% of the way, but just can't quite 
you know, come through with the win there. Uh, Lucas. Fun fact. Fun, real quick. Fun fact about the European guys. They flew into Chicago and rented a car and drove down. That's I don't understand. I don't understand the logic behind it. They were trying to explain it to me. It, it was going right over my head. I had no idea. But uh, shout out to those guys because that must be tough to play a tournament after doing all that traveling. Almost as hard as finding the stats on the PDGA site. Lucas, what do you I, think? I literally looked for it for five more minutes. I couldn't find it. Uh, Calvin's performance was the most uniquely bad. The number one ranked player in the world finishing only two shots inside the cash line in his home state at a course he's familiar with is definitely not something we could expect. Even when it seems like he's playing poorly in the past, he somehow finds himself in the top 10. His worst performance last year was Champions Cup where he got 16th. Seeing last season's player of the year drop a tie for 34th at the first event is surprising. And the way he did it was surprising too. We're used to seeing Calvin miss some putts at this point, even some short ones. But back to the point I made last question, throwing is the biggest predictor of success in disc golf. Calvin's throwing is what makes him great. And this weekend, his ferry percentage was 57.9%. Just for some perspective, last year, Calvin finished with the highest fairway hit percentage in the field, requiring at least 200 observations at 80%. For you non-math folks out there, that's a 25% decrease from his average last season in the first event this season. This was a course that relied heavily on throwing accuracy a skill which we know Calvin to have in spades and would therefore expect him to perform well at. Instead, we see him struggle all weekend, despite putting up 100% from C1X in days two and three. The most likely pick to win finishes 15 strokes off the win, eight strokes outside the top 10, and three shots out of a top 25. Um, I, I kind of wonder if this is the first event rust. Uh, it kind of seems like Calvin might be the Nikola Jokic of the disc golf. He just kind of used disc golf as his job and does become so back to doing what he actually wants to do. So this seemingly rusty start to the season might only add to that narrative, and I'd love to hear from Brody on that as someone who knows him a little better. I do appreciate you throwing in the doing the math for us, folks that struggle with math. That was very nice of you. Very nice touch there. Um, definitely might have earned you. But okay. Yeah, a little condescending, but you know it's, it's hard when I'm the person he was talking to and I needed that. So I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> next up we have Matthew. What do you think? Okay, my most surprising performance this weekend had to be the young guns. Uh, Michelle talked about it. I mean, just in general, they were everywhere. But even the guys like Joseph Anderson or more well-known as Joey Buckets, they're already doing pretty well on tour. He popped off there, but even people, Braden Sides, uh, Cal Longquist, other people that are just starting out on their tour, did they finish all in the top 10? No. But they're out there, and really quickly, we started to see some of their potential. And even better, people like Brain Science are immediately going to YouTube to make themselves really, really well-known for their sponsors and those kind of things. Putting up, I think they had the, the one of the first videos of Olympus for their like practice round. Like Brain's was up like a week and a half ago um, before that. So just having these names out here, there, brand new people and having the potential to finish well. And if you watch their stuff, you know, they have the potential to finish well. They're just like not scared of anything. They're just, and I would love to see as we move on, I bet you one of those names is in the top 10 or top 20, just about every week from here on to the rest of the season. All right. I mean, first bold a, take of the easy, show. That's an easy bet to take. I'll take your money gladly. Yeah, I was. The heck, are you doing? I was going to say that's a that was a that was a hot take. The first hot take of the show last week. Is, we had Steven calling Ricky a bust, and this week we have you know Matthew saying those guys are going to be in the top ten every week. So yeah, that's All an right. interesting one. Brody, what surprised you the most? Well, to answer Lucas's question, I haven't talked to Calvin after the tournament, so I'm not entirely sure what's going on there. I honestly think he is is dealing with some sort of. That would be my guess. Um, but I'm glad no one said my answer because I'm trying to turn a new page this year. I'm trying to be more positive and look on the bright side. So I'm not going the Lucas route and like going for someone that did poorly and trying to like, you know, dig them their grave even deeper. I'm looking at the positive here. And I'm going to go with someone that we used to talk about this guy a lot. This guy was an up and comer. This was a guy that threw really far. Everyone was like, holy crap, he's the next big thing. And then he got injured and kind of fell off a little bit and people forgot about him. And I'm talking about Gavin Rathbun. Finished tied for six at this event. Going into this event, this is not a course that you would, it would scream Gavin, Gavin Rathbun. This is going to be a course that he's going to tear apart. He finished his last two events um, on tour or majors wise. Uh, cause these were majors, not on tour, but 107th at USDGC, 46th at worlds. 
Last year, he played in a lot of events. He only had four top 25s last year. So last year was not a good year. And people kind of just completely forgot about this guy. This guy has an incre- incredibly high ceiling. If he is healthy, that's his biggest problem these last, last I would say, two years or so is being healthy. Uh, that's a name to watch out for. Definitely. That was a name that I was excited to see uh, climbing the leaderboard over the weekend. And um, yeah, hopefully this is a sign of good things to come because he was, you know, prior to the injury and everything, a guy that had really no ceiling uh, and it felt like he was going to really pop off at any moment. And it's, it's good to kind of see that happen. So definitely surprising a lot of uh, a lot of ways there. Quick points update as we head into these next two topics. We have Lucas in the lead at 11, Brody and Michelle tied at 10 and Matthew at nine. Um, we're going to head to look at the course now a little bit. This was the debut of Olympus on the tour. Um, and it played as one of the toughest courses that we've seen on tour with over half of the MPO field finishing over par after three rounds and the majority of the FPO field shooting over par. How do you feel like this course played this weekend? And is it a good addition to the tour? Lucas, what are your thoughts? I absolutely loved it. I think it was a great addition to the tour. I think it filmed better than I was expecting with all the hills involved. So shout out to the camera crews for doing a great job. I think it tested all the skills the pro should have and ones that we really haven't seen be put together at the same time before. The par fours in particular stood out to me in that many of them required some combination or a combination of all three of height control, angle control, speed control, and even fourth, a little bit of spin control on the tee shot and the approach shots. The greens here are very tricky, both for approaches and for putts, which is one thing I think challenged these pros the most. It was great. I love playing and seeing challenging courses be played. I think it makes for more entertaining and exciting golf where some brain power is required instead of just shot execution. However, we've seen these players be forced to attack difficult courses before. I think this course had all of the right elements prevalent at the other tough courses on tour like the Gorge at North Cove and Northwood Black. It punishes being extra aggressive and demands you to play smart golf. I've gotten the pleasure to play some tournament rounds with Joey uh, a couple, uh, a few times now, Joey Buckets. And I can tell you that that is one of his best skills. He's just a smart golfer. Although we saw him get punished a couple of times this weekend for getting too aggressive, overall he was able to capture a top 10 finish, not because of flashy sh- shots or insane scrambles. It was his consistency. The current pro tour as a whole rewards pedal to the metal at all times golf. So I love being uh, seeing more uh, different skills being challenged like smart shots instead of just throwing the same shot in every hole the good news is it seems we're seeing more of these courses join the tour and i'm especially excited for worlds this year where i believe we'll see another couple of courses like that in new london and ivy hill all right lucas loves it matthew what do you think i love it man it's awesome listen here's the thing i i I feel like most of the time at this point in both professional disc golfers and people watching it or watching the tour they're just like oh is it far below par? And if it is, then all right, let's make that happen. We saw a insanely cool course that maybe it was new or maybe it was newish. They were adjusting some stuff. We saw an insanely cool course and we saw pros have to fight to really put a good round in. Um, and some pros were really mad about this. Chandler Kramer just put out some comments about this that he did not no. like the course. And no. there was no trimming. He would never. No. <laughs> no trimming and no he and, and would never. needs cut up and trimmed up. Here's my question, Chandler. If you throw a bad shot, shouldn't there be grass preventing you from throwing an amazing second shot? You just threw a bad first shot. That that's what a lot of this stuff where we have these courses that actually punish you for being a little left or a little right. And it's like, what? I couldn't throw out an insane gap. Did anyone see Aaron Gossage in that one shot just so deep in some trees that no one could even, a cameraman couldn't get in there to video him? He threw a bad shot. He should go into a bad spot for that. So I think in my head, I would like this scoring closer than I would like 40 under pars for an event. And I think this course was sick. I was so, I had so much fun watching coverage of this event. Awesome. Yeah. Two for two. And I had not seen the Chandler Kramer uh, comments there. Uh, Very interesting to to hear that. Would you like to hear them real quick or I've got them right here. Yeah. You know what? If you haven't pulled up, let's let's hear it. He said he he complimented the staff and he said, that being said, I didn't enjoy my time on this course. Playing this course felt like it was more work than it was fun to play (laughs) for my style of golf. It's the hardest course I'm going to play all year. It's not even close. I like a good challenge, but this felt impossible. It may be scenic, but in my opinion, it needs trimming, cutting, and cleaning. Okay. There you have it. Unfortunate course design. That's just unfortunate course design. Yep. Couldn't agree more. It is. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) All right. Let's see. Brody, what'd you think of it? 
So first thing, yeah, it, it obviously was a very tough course, but something to keep in mind is the field strength at this event was on the low end side. I know the way that they're doing uh, the tour cards and how they're tiering getting into these events. I think you're going to see not that many events with anyone under a thousand rated in the actual events. The reason why this one was lower is because it's one event in Florida and then we're going into Texas. So there was a lot of people we didn't see at this event that are a top 50, top 75 player. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, but it is obviously a very tough course. There's no real gimme birdie holes. A lot of these tough, even these tough courses that we play on tour, there's still two, three, four holes that you walk up to being like, I want to walk away with a birdie. There weren't really any holes like that on this course. The greens also made every single hole pretty much bogeyable, which is another thing we don't see often where you might have a tough tee shot, but if you get off the tee clean, no problem. You're going to make par. Even if you get off the tee clean in some of these holes, you can still struggle with rollaways or your approach shot with some of these greens. Um, and I think it's a great addition. Hopefully they will continue to improve it. It being its first year on tour, I think there are slight improvements that we will see. And then the last thing I have to say is, Lucas, what the heck is spin control? It is what it sounds like, man. Yeah, go for it. What's spin control, Lucas? So I was just talking with Raven Newsom this uh, past a couple weekends ago, and he was saying that if you want your disc to sit more gently on a hill, then you actually need to put more spin on it because the the force of the disc is going to be caught by the spinning of the ground rather Time than out. if you have less. I don't even care about the ahead. physics of that making no sense. Time out. So are you telling me that Raven Newsom, when he throws, he's when he throws normal, he's not throwing with as much spin as possible. He can actually add more spin if he wanted to. That's what you're telling me. I think yes, because like there's a different wrist pop that you can do if you want to put more spin on it. Um, or maybe like nose up is what he's talking about also. So um, that was just the way he explained it. But if I could continue, okay. that would be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, but it, like the hitting on a lot of with less spin actually makes your disc more likely to pick up and roll because there's no um, there's no force being applied to your disc. So the, the ground doesn't have anything to receive. Never thought of it that way. Interesting. I could see. I could see the nose angle control. That nose angle makes sense. Spin, I've never mm -hmm. heard of that way. I gotta think through it. I gotta think through it. I, I'm just I like gonna go the, out I out. like I like how it sounds. Can I say that? Go, I like yeah, the idea I'm, behind it behind it. Hey again, I'm going out on a limb. It's not like I know anything or I've talked to a lot of people that know stuff about disc golf. Spin control is just something that doesn't exist. All no, right, one no one's stepping up to a T and saying, I'm gonna add fifty more fifty more revolutions of spin on this shot. They might, they might ch change their disc. They might change how hard they throw. Is but that no one's throwing? Like no one's throwing seventy. Throw. No one's throwing seventy miles per hour at fourteen hundred revolutions and seventy miles an hour at thirteen hundred revolutions. No one's doing that. Well, I'm not talking about like the power shots necessarily as much as I'm talking about like the approach shots. I can see approach shots. Approach sense? shots make sense. Like I, you can definitely like slow wrist, like fast arm, slow wrist or fast arm, fast right. wrist and, and adjust how aggressive something's coming into the green. I, I understand that. I've always viewed it as nose angle, that but I think we're probably talking about hand, similar thing. That still goes hand in hand with spe the speed of the disc. To a certain degree, no, I would, no I would think. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. I th right. until until we have more data we're never going to know realistically it's just what the feel of it but we still got one more person to answer this question michelle yeah thank you what did you, what did you think of the Sorry, course was it a good addition to the tour let's focus back in here go ahead yeah everyone's been so positive and i'm going to be too i think it's a great addition to the tour i think from a viewer's perspective i've been watching the live coverage and i think that they like i agree they did a really good job considering that it's so so many trees so much elevation and it was actually enjoyable to watch and uh, they really catch that and the feeling um and it's also fun to see the pro struggle and get challenged a bit uh, i also think that it's i agree that it's fun to watch something that's not like 12 under 15 under each round uh it it gets more exciting and it gets a little tougher and every round counts in a different way i think um uh, and it's also exciting to watch um 
the ending of the course because I think that it has some really tough holes and it really opens up. Uh, and I think that watching FPO, like Evelina really stepped up and she really finished hole 18 beautifully uh, compared to her uh, card mates. Um, yeah. And I also like that it has more par fours than threes because I really do like par fours and it's fun to see the pros plan holes and how they attack holes differently, uh, forehand, backhand, if they want to go length, no length. Like, uh, I really do think that that makes it so much more exciting. Yeah, you I'm guys really... liked hole 17? I think yeah. it, it came I through good on camera. I don't know. I don't know if I would have liked playing it, but it, it looked, it <laughs> no. filmed good. Yeah, I thought, I thought that was one of the, wor one of the more wor uh, bad holes on the court. I can, that can make sense. Was it as I, gimmicky as it looked? Yeah, that's that's my issue is like there's two there was two fairways you go down the right or the left the right you really can't get birdie from but it is a little bit safer the left it was just very difficult playing in the practice rounds and playing in the tournaments it was very difficult like no one threw a shot because it's completely blind to us so no one threw a shot and could immediately like turn around and be like that's perfect you would throw your shot gotcha. and you'd literally look at the spotter to be like, am I inbounds? Mm. And that was everyone. So to me like that, that was the only issue I had down the stretch was I just thought 17 was kind of misplaced because 16 was such a freaking good hole. 15 so good. 14 is really good. And then 18 is a great finisher. 17 kind of felt like, um, if you guys remember 17 at the open of Austin, where it was just like that wooded course out of nowhere and it kind of just fell out of place a little bit and people would get like off the fairway and it kind of felt like that a little bit. So that, that was, I just wanted, I didn't know if that translated to uh, live coverage to you. I don't think it necessarily did because we were able to catch, to jump to catch cam and see the discs come in. So like mm -hmm. it was easy for me, at least after watching a few rounds to notice a good shot as soon as it crested the hill because you, you could watch how it was finishing. So you could tell angle wise, but I did have the thought of like, I would hate throwing that tee shot because like, I feel like I would lose so many discs because you just go a little left and like, I have no idea where it's going to go. Like, I feel like I could be looking all over the place and it's just sitting in that pond there. But I'm glad Michelle did bring up how it filmed because I think that was one of the big feedbacks I saw online was, we, was typically, we typically come into the season at Vegas. And to be honest, Vegas playing it is electric. It was awesome watching it it can be boring because it just doesn't translate super well being a golf course so it was a nice switch of pace and also the finishing stretch especially with ab uh coming into 17 there he made us sweat because the finishing stretch was hard and challenged the pros so uh i agree with everyone i think it was an awesome addition to the tour i think it was a great kickoff to the tour and i'm excited to see what they do with the course as it continues to develop and hopefully stays on tour now, heading into the final regular topic, we got a quick points update here. Brody and Lucas are tied in the lead at 16. Michelle's close behind at 15, and Matthew is at 14. Tight race so far. Tight race so far. Um, final topic here. According to a recent interview, Steve Hill from UDisc confirmed that UDisc offered the PDGA a discount for their members for nothing in return to the PDGA, and it was turned down, which has since led to speculation that the PDGA is developing a competitor to UDisc. Would this be a wise move for the PDGA and why or why not? Matthew. Okay, so I have to say one thing about this. It, we can consider two cases. One, the PDGA is making their own version of UDISC. And two, the PDGA is doing what the PDGA does and making snap decisions really quickly that don't make a lot of sense for the future. We, we have this exact same thing we've seen over the off season where it's like, is this a smart decision PDGA is making about something we don't know about? Or do they accidentally ask one guy and he didn't ask anyone else? If they are making their own app, I think it makes a lot of sense to do that. They've already got a ton of the data. You've already got PDGA numbers and uh, player info. It makes it really easy to add in a lot of these other features or maybe condense them. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that level goes. I think Griplock said something similar, but a ratings or unofficial ratings for random rounds would probably make sense. A lot of these things uh, stand to reason they would make sense in this case. The question is, can they do it better than UDISC has or is at this moment? Um, UDISC is really intuitive. It really does a good job with a lot of its behind the scenes stuff and what you guys see when you're actually using the app. So 
unless they do better than that or offer round ratings, because I think people are fiends for that, they're going to have a hard time traveling people across their app, but it could be happening. All right. So Matthew's not completely opposed to it. Brings up some good points of uh, things to consider here. Brody, what's your thoughts on it? Well, you know, I went to the uh, PDJ mission statement, which was easier to find than the the statistics, which I still cannot find. Easier Um, to say, too. (laughs) Yeah, easier to say, for sure. The NISWA says, the PDJ is a membership organization dedicated to the promotion and sustainability uh, growth of disc golf, which basically means, again, it's a membership organization. If they don't have members, there is no organization. So the members are the ones that drive it. To develop disc golf in a globally recognized competitive sport and recreational activity through player participation, tournament development, spectator participation, course development, rules and competitive standards, media and sponsor relations, public education and outreach. This is to sustain and grow, to sustain the growth of the organization membership in disc golf by means of financial stewardship asset and resource resource management and membership support. I don't know where in there it makes sense to them be like, we need to make our own U disc. Also, I don't know any member of the PDGA that is asking their funds that they are giving the PDGA to put in to making a product that already exists and is probably the number one disc golf product. Like, I think pretty much everyone is very happy with UDISC. So to me, this, is, this makes no sense. And uh, it's on par for the PDJ. So I'm not surprised. <laughs> All right, Brody comes from a different angle. I appreciate the research of looking that up there. Um, but yeah, okay, there's the other angle. We've had the one too. Michelle, what do you think about it? Yeah, I don't think it, that it's a wise move. I don't think that it's a wise move unless it's fully thought through and has been fine-tuned before it's released and like let's face it that's not something the pga is great at doing um i think that udisc is so big and so used like all over the world uh we even have a person here in sweden who (laughs) dedicates like his life to putting every little basket every little course on udisc and play it in sweden uh and i think that the majority of players disc golf players are using udisc uh, how do you compete with an application like and a website that has gotten so far? Like you just grew with the sport and the pandemic, so it would be really hard to compete with. I think that if they were to release something, how would it work? Would it cost something? Uh, would it be included in the PDGA membership? And like not everyone wants to be a PDGA member. Uh, is it going to cost then? Uh, how will like the PDGA wait? PDGA work with that and if it's going to beat UDISC it has to be like more accessible and have the same like user friendliness and I really doubt that that's going to work yeah you do bring up a really good point of uh the the PDGA and the Pro Tour do seem to want to throw things out there before they've been tested unfortunately we've seen that these past few weekends Lucas what's your thoughts on it So I do think that the centralization of the different facets of disc golf is a good thing, generally speaking. I believe I currently have four apps on my phone for disc golf, five if you include Disc Golf Valley, an entire window window of Google Chrome set up just for tournament registration. Bringing all of these outsourced elements under one umbrella only makes it easier for people to try and get into the sport. There's one place to look for live scores, for doing your own scores, for finding tournaments or leagues to play in, and for finding courses near you. Disc golf is still small enough that this consolidation makes sense. That doesn't mean that there's not room for competitors, though. I think competition in the marketplace is a great thing, leading to more innovation, which means we get better products with more features and possibilities. I'd love to see them do this with their own update of statistics measured, like some new putting elements similar to what we saw them do this past weekend with total footage of putting and longest putt. In addition, I'd love to see them redefine what a green was for putting purposes. I don't know if we'll see a better example this year than not all 20 footers being created equal than hole 14 with the big tree directly to the left of the basket. But that's just a thing I'd like to see personally as an example of what they could do to make this a little differentiated from UDISC. Overall, as long as they're trying to make a better product than UDISC and not just creating the same thing, I think people will be happy with it. If they just copy UDISC, I think people will call them lazy and monopolistic. But if they're able to provide a better product, I don't see the majority of people complaining about it. So because it provides a more centralized location for people getting into the sport and for the opportunity to have some creative and innovative license, I think designing their own competitor to UDISC is a fine move and not something any of us should be surprised by. Yeah, I do. Okay, Brody, Brody can, you know, I was just going to say, I do agree with the statement of if it is 
better than UDisc when it comes out. That is a but crucial why? point. Because if it's the same as UDisc, what's, yes. the, ex- what's the point of its existence? Do we, do but Brody, we think UDisc exactly. exactly. does not want to change? Do we think UDisc is like hard-headed and they're like, hey, you know what, PDGA, we don't want to listen to you. Hey, Disc Golf Pro Tour, screw you guys. We're going to do it our way. Do we not think that UDisc is willing to change? No, absolutely not. What I'm saying is that the competition that this will provide should make both products better. What competition? Why, 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 why is there a uh, disc is a for profit company. They're trying to make money. So they're trying to get as many users as possible to use them. Why not? The PDJ is not trying to go out and make uh, apps and make uh, products for people to, to buy into. Why, why doesn't the PDJ just work with that company? But what you're trying to say right now is this is an analogy. It's like the PGA saying, you know what? Instead of us letting uh, players that play in PGA events use Discraft and Innova, let's actually make our own disc. And if you're going to play in a PGA event, you have to now use our disc. That is what they're doing. They're creating a product that already exists. U disc. It already exists. It's good. Why? Why do they feel like the need to make it? Why are they spending resources think, that is not their, theirs, members' resources? Why are they doing that? And they're not knocking they're not knocking their job out of the park. It'd be one thing if the PGJ was one of the greatest companies in the world, and they're like, all right, we're dominating. What else can we add to our plate? No, they're trash. <laughs> and now they're trying to create a new product. What are they doing? Lucas, I stop sending we're gonna us give magazines, it. Lucas. We're gonna you give send Lucas us magazines that no one wants. Lucas, we're gonna give Lucas the floor here. We're gonna give Lucas the floor for a chance to rebuttal. I think Lucas works for the PDJ. I, <laughs> I 100% do not work for the PDGA. Oh really? Do you know? Do you have I a PDJ a, number? We're gonna let, we're letting Lucas rebuttal here. We're gonna let Lucas have the floor for a minute. Brody, I do agree with what you're saying that they don't need to reinvent the wheel, and that maybe kicking you disc out right now is too early. They should be focusing on other things. I do agree. But I think centralizing things to make it easier for people getting into their sport to access these things that they can just go to PGA and find all these things in one place. That is what I think could be the benefit of them doing this if it is better than you did. That's the Lucas, whole thing. Lucas, I can't find the stats. Lucas, I can't find the stats. <laughs> no, Enough about that. the stats. What? You can't no. even find the stats. Who, is saying the, who has PGA ever live. said the PDGA <laughs> is easy? No, everything with the PDJ is difficult. So this whole centralization, yeah, let's use, let's take something that re- really makes sense and is easy, user-friendly like UDIS, and now let's put it under the PDJ window that no one knows how to work any of their stuff or find any of their stuff, and heck, their, their server crashed. When was the last time you saw a UDIS server crash during a tournament? Uh, never is the answer, Lucas. So uh, this whole idea of like, hey, let's bring everything centralized under the PDJ. You're that is terrible idea. I do. Unless I do you just, just want to see disc golf blow up. And I do want to point maybe out you're a masochist or whatever that is. I do want to point out arson. four out of the five of us were able to find the stats. That is one thing to keep in the back of our heads here. Michelle, Hunter, were you, you not were you not on that agreement page for for I mean, to be fair, that's disc golf network. But were you not on that agreement page? Trying to figure out how to actually watch live coverage. That was Disc Golf Network, to be fair. Did take me about 10 minutes to find out those were buttons. Didn't look but like they, buttons. I mean, that's... But they are... They're not they are too connected. far from the falling they are connected. tree leaf or whatever that is. Yeah. Michelle, did you have a rebuttal towards Lucas as well, or was everything covered there? I was just going to say, like, if PDGA can't even make, like, PDGA Live user-friendly so that Brody can find the stats, like, how are they going to make you a better version of UDisc? Hey, hey, Lucas, real quick. Do you know what, like, the number one feature is for UDIS Live? That literally <laughs> everyone and their brother would be like, this is my favorite thing to use on UDIS Live? The Probably. favorites. The star favorites tab. Okay. That was, that's a, a no-brainer. Hey, let's make sure that people can favorite their favorite players so they can see. To be fair, that, that, I do. That doesn't to, exist in to PDJ defend, Live. To defend Lucas here, he did I, make in his point. Can I rebut? Yeah, he did make in his point that they would have to have it come out better than you disc, which is highly unlikely the PDJ would do, which would mean y'all are speaking the same language because I think we all yes, know that's not yes, going to happen. Yes. But what, what, Lucas, what are we talking yes. about? So, so I, the question was, could this be a wise move, like theoretically speaking? I was taking it in terms of like the theoretics of having everything under one umbrella. The practicality, you're nailing it on the head. It's not going to be great if the PDJ does it. I agree. The PDJ is kind of garbage, like you said. But just from a theoretical standpoint, is it better to have things in one place? I think yes. 
No. Does that clear it up a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, but then let it continue to be under, like, included in the membership. With Lucas, it's if it's so I good. want a steak, Why I'm not away? going to Golden Corral that has steaks <laughs> and desserts and pizza and Italian and sushi. I'm going to a freaking five star steakhouse, brother. Having everything under but one roof does not make it mean that it's better. Specializing, but, but having Corral someone that's. The you just only specializes in this one product. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's going to be better than PDJ that's trying to do all these other things. And they don't even do well. I think it is going to be better. I think it is going to be better. I think you're right. I'm not saying it's not going to be better. Golden Corral analogy will always win. Okay, we're going to pause <laughs> that topic. We're going to move on. I think both of you made, I think y'all are a lot closer to the same point than uh, a lot of people would think. But oh, we definitely agree with each other. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think at the end of the day, probably <laughs> when we're meets the road, y'all are in full agreement here. So we're going to move on. Uh, I think we settled that one. We're going to go into the finals. So the final score here, we have Brody at 22, Lucas at 21. So y'all are going to get here more of that. And then we have Michelle and Matthew both at 20. Great show by everyone. But let's go Brody and Lucas head to head for the final topic here. All right, um, Brody, you have the advantage, so you're going to get to choose. Do you want to go first or second here? Oh, gosh. Um, knowing it's Lucas, I probably want to go second because I'm probably going to have a rebuttal. Okay, okay. Ah. That is fair. So, all right, AB is clearly one of the most talented throwers of the disc in the sport right now. Now that he has this win under his belt, what expectation do you have for him for the rest of this season? Is this a year of dominance? Does he have more to prove, or is it somewhere in between? Lucas, your floor. I think it's somewhere in between. I think from the outside looking in, we see that AB got a win. We see that he know we know he has the skills to win. He put it all together and he won. But I think as AB looks back at this tournament in the future, he's going to be proud of himself that he won and pulled it out on 18. But those last four holes before that were not super convincing. I believe he had a six stroke lead, if I'm not mistaken, and ended up getting to two strokes on 18, where it was completely plausible that Ricky birdies and he bogeys and they have to go to a playoff. So was it a good performance from AB? Yes, 100%. Was it perfect? Absolutely not. So it only took a couple of things to go Ricky's way for him to come out on top. That said, AB won. There's no disputing that. He's a great player. I think he's going to have a great season. Is he going to be dominant? I don't think I'm ready to say that yet. There's still some inconsistencies in his game that I think his touch can be questionable at times. We saw that on 17 a little bit on his approach shot that was like i, th I want to say it was probably inside 200 feet and he blows at 25 by the basket um and then his putt is just a little stabby to my eye and i worry that that could lead to inconsistency as at times um and so with those two factors especially um i don't think it's like i'm not ready to say that he's going to have a dominant season i do think we're going to see him be an all-star again um i don't think anybody's surprised by that take but as far as is he going to be having more to prove? Yes, he absolutely still does. And I think he thinks he has more to prove as well after the finish. All right, Brody, what's your thoughts on it? So I believe this was his 81st elite or major tournament. And if, if from what I said earlier, this was his 11th time going into the final event, uh, final round on Lee card. So doing the math, that's one out of eight, pretty much. A little bit better than one out of eight tournaments. He is putting himself in a position to win from what he has played. That's not terrible. Now, this is the first time he's actually done it. So I think the confidence and experience of knowing that he can do it is certainly, is certainly going to help him in the future. We've also seen other people break through and, and come out with a win. I think one thing that kind of sets this apart than others is he did have one of the best players in the world, Ricky Wysocki, chasing him down. If this was a tournament, you know, you go and you look like uh, look at OTB, for example, with Emerson Keith. And again, not to discredit that win from Emerson Keith, but you had four people on lead card and there was a reason why Lee Card had a smaller crowd watching him that Sunday than Chase Card. Because you didn't have any of the big names, any of the big guns on Lee Card. So him winning with Ricky kind of breathing down his neck towards the end, I think that definitely holds a little bit more weight moving forward. But if you're thinking this is going to be the year of dominance, I mean, I think, again, what Calvin did last year, I think 
I don't know if we're ever going to see that again. That that's something that is going to be, I think, very very rare. So I don't view that. Um, I don't think he really does have much to prove because it's not like he's not finishing high. He's putting himself in a lot of positions to win. So I think he's going to maybe get another win, maybe two wins, and that would be a very very impressive season this year. All right, both semi agree, but I'm going to give the win here to Brody mainly because of the point of Ricky pushing AB being on lead card there. Lucas, I think you made a point somewhere along the lines of like, he'll look back on some of the strokes and it could have went Ricky's way. I think we can say that about most wins where if it fall chips fall one way or another, it could have went someone else's way. You got to focus on what's, you know, happens to you and how he reacts. And what I saw to AB on 18, I think that was the difference maker where I think that's the change point for me where previously he slips up on 17 and just continues crumbling on 18. And that was the moment where AB put the tourniquet on, stopped the bleeding and stopped Ricky from chasing him down. So Brody Smith is the winner this week. First win of 2024 for Brody here. Victory lap yeah, feels time. Feels like a pity win. Feels like a pity win. Oh. Um, coming off of one of my worst uh, performances ever. So maybe a little pity win here, but I will say one thing, one thing that I didn't like, cause obviously we, I, I was very positive for the majority of this episode. But one thing I didn't like about the course, and I don't think this is a Paul Macbeth issue. I don't even know if this is a disc golf pro tour issue. This might be a PDGA issue is they still make rules for like pace of play. And I don't think that should be something that they should look at of like, Oh, well there could be someone that just is standing here throwing 15 shots. Hole 18 would have been a lot more exciting, a lot more interesting if they didn't have the two drop zones. You throw OB on your tee shot, you go to a drop zone. You throw OB from there, you go to the drop zone, which is like a 45-foot putt. I, I think that hole plays way differently when a player knows that they have to keep throwing until a disc lands inbounds. And I think that's what we all want to see. I don't, wanna, I don't think we want to see AB throw his drive and then literally be able to throw a shot into the cliff, go up to the drop zone, Lay up, tap in, bogey. I don't think we want to see that. And so the other thing I was going to say too is why are we having certain rules for how the cliffs play? Different. Like I, I, that's one thing with disc golf right now that's really confusing me is we have so many rules on every single hole that I just think that is, that is something as a, as a fan, as a spectator, it's very confusing. The commentators have no idea. We should have stuff that's just the same. And so for, I don't know if you guys know this, but the two holes, there's two holes that had like ma massive cliffs that you could throw straight into one of them. You could play from your disc on the cliff. You could play anywhere in line with the disc and where it crossed anywhere in that relief area, or you could go to a drop zone. You had three options. The other one, you had to take your disc and play it from where it crossed into the relief area. So to me, I don't know why those two things are different. I don't know why those are playing differently. Um, and that's just something to think about too. I think moving forward is none of us want to get to hole one and have the starter tell you 16 different things on how these holes are all played differently. We should have a set of rules and that's just how you play disc golf. And it should be like across the board. It shouldn't be confusing. There you have it. It was a nice change of pace to get positive Brody. Uh, I, one thing I will say is I don't think the PDGA got the, got the memo that they were getting positive Brody because they didn't. So they, <laughs> everyone got positive Brody, but the PDGA. No, so, that you know, was positive for disc golf. That's that was fair. Positive for disc golf. Okay. That, that's, that's probably also was positive for you towards the PDGA in a lot of ways too. Another way that to look was, at that it. That was, that was pretty, it that been was worse. pretty mild. That was could've pretty mild. Uh, I appreciate mm -hmm. all the analysts being on great show today. I appreciate each and every one of you for tuning in. If you have a topic that you want to hear on debate night there should be a qr code popping up here you can scan that on your phone and submit your topics and you might just hear your topic be brought up if you're on your phone watching this the link will be in the description down below but other than that we'll be back here same time same place real quick. With oh I, just real quick yeah. i just want i want to know from the comments is this a way better season than last year because i feel like it is and i don't know if it's the guests i don't know if it's the questions i don't know what it is but th last year, this this feels way better. Every it's episode so far has been so much better than last year. It's definitely so the guests and the not comments. the questions because uh, 
Questions have been a little rough at times. I didn't even let Lucas break out a spreadsheet this week. I really let the audience down. I'm very sorry for that. But hey, you know what? There's always next week, and we'll see you then.